Hi again. So today I thought I would talk about how I believe all of this crap actually works together. And some of this is again from documentation, from my friend Dave, from Jim, and things that I can garner online. I thought at first we'd do a quick refresher over the two systems, the two cabinets, and then how they work together. So on our left we have the iOS cabinet, the input-output subsystem. In the center here we have the actual VME chassis that has the iOS systems itself. My machine has four iOS uh, systems. Each has an array of disk controllers, Ethernet controllers, and uh, there's also an FDDI controller in there as well. The iOS talks to the disk shelves. I have six disk shelves in this machine, four disks per shelf for 24 disks. And as we mentioned, they're 10 gig disks, so I have 240, 240 gigs of disk space. The iOS, each individual system will talk to a shelf of disks, the, or more than one, possibly. The system will allow the processor to hand off all control, all of the heavy duty work of running back and forth the file system controls, uh, the block seeks, all of that crap is off offloaded to the iOS. So the iOS spends its time doing the processor cabinet's bidding. Now the processor cabinet, well that's the processor. The cabinet has if it was a 916, four processor boards. In my case, it's got two processor boards and four memory boards. The memory boards in my machine are 128 kilowords. Each of word is 4096 bytes. The processor boards have four processors each. Did I say that already? Mm. This is a vector processor system. They have made some tweaks. Uh, I'm sure there's some ICs in there that have been added so that this can run Unicos, which is a Unix-like operating system. It's not pure Unix, it's certainly not POSIX, but it is a Unix operating system. So instead of the old days where a Cray was completely unlike anything else and the front-end processor did everything, this has a much more familiar feel to it, which made the maintenance of it and the interaction from the technicians considerably easier. The processing cabinet does all of the heavy lifting so you can run jobs on it uh, like a normal timeshare system like a batch processing system if you so choose it's going to do the heavy cranking complex fluid dynamics uh, weather or uh, seismic um, data interpretation and possibly uh, prediction attempts, whatever it is that a supercomputer was used for, tracking particles in a nuclear explosion, those sorts of things. This is the machine, or this is the cabinet, that did all of the heavy lifting in that case. Okay, so how does it work together? The SWS is booted first. It's brought up into its system state. You log in as the user Cray Admin, which has access to the um, software used to control these. These are powered on, uh, main breakers on the back. On the central control unit here, I pointed out the other week that there are two reset buttons. There's a VME reset and a CPU reset. You hit the CPU reset first, you hit the VME reset second. That'll force all of the iOS's in the VME case to reboot. The VME system has to be booted after the processing unit. I'm assuming that's because when the processing unit comes back up, it sends a I'm ready signal and the iOS looks for that. If the processing unit comes up after the iOS, the iOS probably doesn't know it's there. All of the iOS's boot independently. The transceiver that's in there, I believe acts like a hub so there are four iOS's. Each one sends out a boot P request to the SWS on the local Ethernet. Hi, I'm here. This is my MAC address. Tell me something useful. Boot P will give it an IP address and it'll say, this is your kernel name. 
This is the NFS path that you can use. It's possible TFTP is in there somewhere, I'm not certain. That would be the normal protocol, but I haven't seen it mentioned yet. The iOSs will receive their boot instructions. They'll then send out the request on the line and start pulling back the kernel. The iOSs run what's called the iOS V operating system, which is a specialized subset of VxWorks that runs on the Spark Light in these machines. Each of the iOSs will boot up. From the SWS, you can then connect to the iOS. Now, I'm not certain if you can connect to them individually or if there's like a master iOS. I'm not positive how that works. This is one of these sort of big question marks I've got hanging over here. From the iOS, you can then configure the system. The system is configured using a parameter file. This is part of one of the things that I'm most nervous about. The parameter file, it's just param, controls the entire system. It tells the J90 what the hell it is, what the hell it's doing, how to boot, what the disks look like, everything. And when I say what the disks look like, I don't just mean there's 14 gig SCSI disks there and 14 gig, bleh, Schweizer, 14 gig SCSI disks there. What it actually says is all of that and this is the file system. It starts on this disk at this block and it ends on this disk at this block. It may pass across several disks. I will either stripe the disk or band the disk. That's logical disk rather than physical. And in that way, you build up all of the partitions. There's the root, the user, home, temp, swap, opt. There's a half a dozen to a dozen different partitions that you can attach to your Unico system. And in the case of root, user, and home, there is an A and a B. And so you run off your A and you keep a backup copy on your B. So if something catastrophic happens in the iOS V, you can flip the two and boot off the secondary partition. I'm not sure that that gives me a good feeling about the reliability of the Unicos operating system. What I'm hoping is this exists because historically machines were not always the most reliable and downtime for a machine that cost as much as this for what it did was not an acceptable option. So the choice was when root A was busted, you didn't figure out why, you flipped over to the B, brought the system back online so it could return to handling user requests, and then you'd figure out what the hell happened to root A, get things synchronized, and then another maintenance window bounce again. I hope. So, the iOS is up, it's running, the parameter file explains where all of the partitions for Unicos is. The iOS V does not live on a disk, it lives in memory. And then from the iOS prompt, which you've jumped to from the SWS, you say boot. The iOS V will then start to copy the Unicos kernel from the SWS via the ISOV, rather via the iOS, straight into RAM on this machine. This machine, the Y1 cables, gives DMA access to the RAM. So it copies the kernel straight into system memory and then tells it to do a vector reset and the kernel starts kicking over. Kernel boots, it starts pulling the disk partitions off the iOS. It says iOS, give me root. iOS uses the param file to translate to what disk that is, what slice on the disk, and starts assembling and handling the files back. Unicos then completely comes up. It starts in single user mode. You then do an init2, which flips it into multi-user mode, and it is ready to function. In single user mode, you have no uh, networking. Most of the daemons aren't running things like that. In multi-mode, networking's up, so your users can access the system. The quota system is up. Um, the logging system is up, those sorts of things. That's when it is in a proper system-ready state. There are lots of question marks about all of these things. This is how I believe it works, based on what I've read. 
I am not 100% certain. So we will see. And again, this param file thing makes me hellish nervous. The param file, param file tells it how many processes it has, what kind of processes it had, those sorts of things. Well, that's it for today. If you have been, thank you so very much for watching. Next week, we get into even more problems. Woohee! Take care, guys.